So as if you, I'm prepared for this one, by the way. So this, <laughs> I shouldn't be quite as frazzled. <laughs> so. Okay, so hopefully Mark with the live stream is ready somewhere. Um, so last week, um, Father Griffith was talking about the three parables, the um, prodigal son, the good Samaritan, and Lazarus, and the, um, the rich man. But now what's going to happen is Jesus is going to start traveling. And that's kind of the theme of chapter 12 through 19, 27, is that Jesus is going to start traveling to Jerusalem. Now you have an insight into what that's going to be like because you know what's going to happen at Jerusalem. So those of us who've read the gospel for years or at least even just part of it, know the end story, that Jesus is going to go to Jerusalem and he's going to be crucified and die and resurrected. But remember that the people that are on the journey with him have no clue that this is what is happening. They know he's causing quite a stir. They know that that's problems. But they don't exactly know what's going to happen when they get to Jerusalem. And in the couple of times in today's uh, God, in today's Gospels, in these chapters, Jesus is going to allude to that. He's going to say something about that. And you're going to see the disciples are still, I mean, we all know the disciples kind of are always confused about these things, as we kind of saw this morning in the Transfiguration story. I don't think they told, I, once again, I don't think they kept their mouths shut because they, they understood. I think they kept their mouths shut because it was just unbelievable that this had happened and they didn't know what to say about it so um, because if, it, if they'd understood it I'd have gone running back to the other nine disciples and said guess what I saw that you didn't get to see <laughs> so, but they didn't understand so Jesus is going to begin his journey now uh, from from where he's at with his disciples and his followers and he's going to journey to Jerusalem and to his death he knows this. Um, and in that, he continues to call people to repentance, which we saw John the Baptist do that before Jesus even began his ministry. John the Baptist were, was calling people to repentance and to baptize them. So that's, that's been out there for a while, even before Jesus began his ministry. But what we also know is the, the apostles, after Jesus is... is gone to heaven and leaves the Holy Spirit, the apostles call people to repentance. So what is this form, folks? What was I talking about this morning? This form's a trinity. This form's a trinity of three calls for repentance. The one before Jesus it, it begins his ministry, Jesus' own call in his ministry, and the apostles calling us to repentance after Jesus leaves through the power of the Holy Spirit. Are you beginning to see Trinity everywhere? It's just everywhere. So, um, and you know, it's, it's, it's established in God and it just keeps on growing. And it just, it, it enlightens us when we look at these things. With the Trinity is so present in our lives. So Jesus is calling people to this new relationship. This relationship where Jesus begins to explain to them that what you see here is quite different than what is going to happen in the kingdom. And Father Griffith and I think Father Collins both talked about that reversal of what makes you powerful here is the opposite of what makes you powerful.
that would be okay because I'm Dutch. So, <laughs> so okay. <sighs> technology. Maybe there's a reason why Jesus didn't have technology, right? It's too much to deal with. <laughs> Oh, no, this ministry is going to be so complicated if I have to worry about a PA system. So, as I was saying, so we have Jesus in the center, and then we have the disciples in the, in the circle closest to him. Oddly enough, it begins to look like the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, those who are kind of wanting to cause him the problems, it looks like they're the next circle in as you move out. So, followers... And then the Jewish leaders, the law, the law leaders, and so there. And then we have this mass crowd. So when we begin with chapter twelve, it again says the crowd gathered by the thousands, and Jesus begins to speak to his disciples, warning them about the Pharisees. Now the Pharisees are there. I mean, they never left Jesus alone. And so when, when they're talking about this, Jesus is very close to the disciples, but he's still kind of having to remind them because the disciples are somewhat afraid of the Pharisees. They know that they're there to cause Jesus problems. But what is a Pharisee? You know, I want to make sure because you know sometimes we get up here and use words that nobody completely understands. And um, I don't want to assume that everybody understands who a Pharisee is. But the Pharisees were noted for their strict observation of rites and ceremonies and the written law. Um, and so, uh, for, and for insistence upon the validity of their own oral traditions concerning the law. In other words, they are, well, Father Griffith, I'm not going to say they're the lawyers if, he, if you're watching. But, you know, they're kind of the cops in a way, too. So they may be, some of them are lawyers, but some of them are cops. And they're making sure that people follow the law, which is what Jesus has said before. You make sure the people follow the law, but you're actually not following it sometimes yourselves. So, um, so one of the, we know that Jesus is talking in parables. And the parables seem to be indicative of Jesus. This is kind of a story form that Jesus used. And so sometimes that sometimes we understand it, and sometimes it's confusing. There's going to be a confusing parable in all of this. But the first parable that we see in this big crowd in the, at, the, at this beginning of the traveling to Jerusalem is the parable of the rich fool. And that parable is so well known that the line from it has come down to us today. So the rich fool is the guy who has all of these crops, all these riches. He has no place to store them. That is how rich he is. He has all of, all of these grains and everything. And, and what does he say? He doesn't really say, I have to get more. He says, I have to build a place to keep it. I want to keep it. It's mine. I earned it. I want to keep it. I'm not going to share it. I'm not thinking about the people who need it. It's mine, and I'm going to build more barns to keep it. And then once I've done that, and I know I'm secure in what I have to live in this world, then I'm going to relax and eat and be merry because Life is wonderful. I don't have to worry about dying. I've got all of these things stored up for me. And relaxing, I mean, you know, just relaxing in what you have. I'm wealthy. Uh, you know, I think right now, compared to what the people are going through in Ukraine, we have this sense of we used to be really relaxed in what we have. But now we see in an instant it can be gone when we see these people packing up backpacks and strollers and leaving everything they've ever known to cross into a country that they do not know on the, on the hope that they will be taken care of. So this man is saying, I'm taking care of myself. And then God says, you fool, tonight your life will be required of you. So 
I'm not saying sometimes you can't eat, drink, and be merry. <laughs> you know, we put on the end of it, God's kind of, the, the, the last thing that God says, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you shall die. And the thing that happens when that happens is all that stuff you got saved up, all that stuff that was just for you, all that stuff that you thought was going to give you length of days, it doesn't matter one bit. You can't haul it up to your ox and carry it with you. It's not going with you. It stays here, and you're going to judgment. So, in verses 22 through 34 of chapter 12, we kind of hear Jesus saying to us, don't worry. People that didn't have a lot of money were always worried about where their next meal was coming from. Luckily, I have never had to do that. I pray that none of you have ever do, had to do that, to wonder where were you going to get your next meal. But this was part of the society and, and continues to be part of our societies today. But verses 23 through 34 talk about don't worry. The Father knows what you need. Strive for his kingdom, and all these things will be given to you as well. Sell your possessions Give alms. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now there's a lot of talk about selling all your possessions. It's going to come up several times in these chapters of Luke. Sell everything you have and give it away. And we talk in Lent about alms. So this is specifically saying sell your possessions, give alms. In other words, help others. And the Father knows what you need. And it will be given to you. It's going to come up again. He's, God's going to give us what we need. Now, sometimes we get upset because God doesn't necessarily give us what we need when we want it. And oftentimes, God does not give us what we want, but what we need. And sometimes we don't even feel like God has kind of provided us with what we need at the moment. You know, if you're in Minnesota in the wintertime and you forget your coat, as this girl from Florida has done, you need a coat. <laughs> and mine is back at the condo because I, I don't go outside until I get here. And I'm like, you know, God's like, I gave you a coat, you just didn't bring it with you. You know, you just, you know, sometimes we forget what we have. We leave it behind. And God's like, I gave it to you, you dummy. <laughs> So I learned a lesson from that. See, I leave my coat in the car when I get home, so I don't leave it behind. And then that follow by when we're told to sell all our possessions and give alms, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus quickly moves to another parable of the fig tree. Now we know about the fig tree. The fig tree wasn't giving fruit. It wasn't doing what it was called to do. Its natural call was to give fruit. And the... The, the owner of the fig tree comes by with a gardener and he says, cut it down. It's useless. Cut it down. It's been this way for three years. I've watched this stupid tree stand here for three years and do nothing. So take it down. And the gardener says, give me one more year. Give me one more year. And I'm going to really take care of it. And let's see what happens. And if it doesn't produce fruit in the next year, we can cut it down. What does this mean for us? It's a parable about repentance. God is saying to us, produce fruit, produce fruit, produce fruit. And then Jesus comes along and says, give me one more year. Give me one more shot at helping convert this little fig tree into a producing fig tree. And if I can't do it as a son of God, then take it out. Take it out. So that's the parable. Jesus is always calling us. Their call is always there. But there's going to come a time when it's going to be required of you that you make a decision. That you just can't stand there and do nothing. You can't relax with all your belongings. It is not going to get you to the kingdom of God. You can't not produce fruit. 
You need to produce fruit to build the kingdom of God. We all have that role in building the kingdom of God. The next story is about the woman that's been bent over for 18 years. Deb, you can tell me if I'm wrong, but I read somewhere where this was caused by uh, spinal fusion, where she gets bent over more and more. And as, as most of us women know now, this is kind of a natural thing if you live long enough, unfortunately. But she's been this way for 18 years. It's kind of a, an older woman at this point. And she's in the crowd. And remember, there's kind of thousands of people in the crowd. Oddly enough, she doesn't call out to Jesus. Jesus picks her. So she's not asking for anything. Jesus is wanting to do something with her. He's going to change her. He's going to help her, to save her. But he's criticized when he does that. He heals her. And who's standing next in the circle? Well, of course, the Jewish leaders, the Pharisees. And so he's criticized because this happens on the Sabbath. We know they don't like that. So, and then he tells a story about if your ox or donkey had fallen into a ditch or a pit on a Sabbath, wouldn't you get them out? And then later on, he says, if your child, he's going to say, if your ox or your child falls into a ditch on the Sabbath, wouldn't you pull them out? This has to do with Jewish law. They're lawyers, remember, they're the cops. If they see you doing this on a Sunday, you're going to have to meet the requirements that let you do on the Sabbath. You're going to have to meet the requirements that allow you to do that, or you're going to have to wait until the next day. And they want to know why he didn't wait. She's been that way for 18 years. Why didn't he wait until the next day? And Jesus says, as a daughter of Abraham, and remember that phrase, as a daughter of Abraham, isn't she more valuable than an ox or a donkey? And all his opponents were put to shame, but the entire crowd rejoiced at the wonderful things Jesus was doing. The law keepers are put to shame because they should have known she was more valuable than an ox or a donkey. And the crowd knew that. And so they rejoice at what Jesus has done. Then we move into the parable of the mustard seed and the yeast. So the, the farmer, the gardener, plants the mustard seed. And, you know, I mean, we've seen those little seeds. Have you seen those little necklaces that have the little seed in them? So... We know how really tiny it is. And then it grows into this great big bush. And the woman who was kneading dough, does this sound familiar to you? <laughs> From making meat pies yesterday and all the dough, which became a little problem, I guess, along the way. But she takes just a little bit of yeast. And in what little dough she has, and she sticks that in there, it says overnight it can become three times the size if you just wait overnight. So what's Jesus telling us? These are the kingdom parables. The kingdom of God starts small and grows. So it starts from the disciples. The next people to get the message are the Pharisees, but they're rejecting it. But now we have to grow out into the circle and the people, the crowd, the poor people, the crippled people, the children, the women, it begins to grow. In other words, from the smallest, and remember in the Hebrew Testament too, Israel was a small tribe when they were first founded, the sons of Jacob. They were small in the eyes of the greater cultures of their time. And then it grows. You only have to start and let it grow. Now Jesus is going to reverse things. We have, notice these parallels between men and women, okay? The mustard seed has to do with the gardener who's a male. 
the, and Jesus um, and the woman is the female. So we got that balanced out. Now, Jesus called the woman who was crippled for 18 years and heals her. Now he's, gonna, he's going to heal a man with dropsy. This is a swelling of tissues, correct? A swell, where your body retains water and moisture in your... And so he, he's, they don't know what to do with this, of course. And actually, he was seen as unclean. But this man, Jesus is eating with the Pharisees. He's eating, he begins eating. This is chapter 14. Jesus, Jesus loved to eat. And he didn't care who he ate with. You know, it's that we say he called tax collectors and sinners. But he's also with the Pharisees. I mean, they're dining too. Jesus will eat with any of us. We're invited to any table that Jesus is at. So he's eating with the leader of the Pharisees on the Sabbath. The leader. And now this man with dropsy comes forward and he appears. He kind of just appears there. We're not sure kind of where he came from. If he just like crashed at the dinner party or if he was a servant perhaps. But um, Jesus now, when they told him before it wasn't legal to heal on the Sabbath, why didn't you wait? And then they were ashamed. Now he's going to turn to the leader of the Pharisees and say to him, is it lawful? the heal on the Sabbath? You know what happened before and you had nothing to say. I'm giving you a chance to say it. Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? But they were silent. And after Jesus heals this man, he asks again about the ox and the child. Wouldn't you save your ox or your child? And they were silent. So wouldn't you have liked to have just seen Jesus shut them up? This, you know, kind of itinerant preacher just and, and these lawgivers, and just he just says the right thing and they can't respond because they know he's right. Now, see, I, I know why they're not responding, because they know he's right. This happens with couples, you know, when you're fighting or something and you realize you've lost the battle. Sometimes you don't say, I'm sorry. Sometimes you don't say, I'm wrong. Sometimes you just shut up. <laughs> it's like, we're done. We're not arguing anymore. That was, you know, so when you've got no leg to stand on, you just don't say anything. Now, there's going to be a parable about the place of honor at the table. Once again, this table, this bank with this eating thing is all over the place in Luke. But where's the last meal? Do you remember? Father, Father Rask is going to talk about this traveling and eating meals with everybody. It's leading up to something. What's it leading up to? The last supper. The last meal. The most important meal. So now he's talking about who do we invite into the dinner and do you invite people who can pay you back? Well, that's nice, but you know, it's nice to have somebody invite you to dinner after you've been to their house, but sometimes it's obligatory, you know? Sometimes people, oh, well, we have to invite them over because they had us over, and it's like, we, we have to do that. Um, but. Jesus is saying, oh, you need to invite people who can't repay you. You'll be repaid in the resurrection if you do that. The payment's not here. The payment's not here for the kindness. The payment's here, the payment's on the other side. It's on the reverse side. And if you do what is right here, if you care for those who can't pay you for what you're doing for them, if you're doing the right thing, you'll be paid back later. So what happens when invited guests don't show up for dinner? So when the, the host sees that the invited guest hasn't shown up for dinner, he tells the servants, go out and compel. This is the word that's used in uh, the um, New Revised Standard Edition. New Oxford Annotated Bible, New Revised Standard Version. The word that they translate here is to compel. It's not just ask people. It's, I'm here to get you to do this. 
you know, this, there's great food, all you can eat, all you can drink, green beer, you know, all that sort of stuff. I'm here to compel you to come share this dinner with my master. He wants to fill his house. He wants to have a great party and offer you something freely. But they don't come. One of them has to, you know, he's just married. He's got a, you know, a wife that he's just married to. One of them, they all, several of them that have been invited have something to do. They can't enjoy the gift. They're not ready to accept the gift. So then the servants go out and they invite the people in the streets, the people close by. But they don't fill up the house. And then they go out into the fields and they get the people who are on the outside of that circle and they fill the house. So we can see what's going on. The real leadership for the kingdom of God are the ones who turn down the gift. And then those people that are the, the Jewish community that does accept the gift of Jesus and the offering of the kingdom, they don't fill the house. So now we go out to people we have no idea of. They have no history of Judaism or any. They, they, have, they may be worshiping what we call foreign gods. They don't know about the one true God, but we're going to invite them into that meal anyway. And they fill the house. They, f- they fill the kingdom. Now he says something in moving along in our travels with the large crowd. Once again, Luke is specific in talking about a large crowd. And he says, whoever does not hate father and mother, wife, children, brothers, and sisters... There's a lot of women in that, by the way. (laughs) Even life itself, whoever does not even hate life itself cannot be my disciple. And then he continues on to say, none of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all your possessions. Tough sayings. It's like everything that is important to you, you have to be willing to give up for love of the Lord. He has to be the most important thing. If you want to continue to live in the kingdom of the world, keep these things. If you want to live in the kingdom of God, be willing to give them up. Be willing to give up everything that's necessary to live in the kingdom of God. Now we're moving into chapter 15. We're going to find tax collectors. I'm so glad I'm not a tax collector. In every generation, I think tax collectors are really hated. (laughs) So, So we find the tax collector and the sinners are coming to listen to Jesus. Well, the Pharisees and the scribes didn't like this either. There's not much they did like about Jesus, but they sure don't like tax collectors and sinners coming. Part of the reason is because they're inviting him to their house to eat. And then the other, well, he welcomes sinners and eats with them. Why, 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 why would he do that? We've offered him places at our table, and yet he continues to eat with sinners and tax collectors. And then we see Jesus tell the parable of the lost sheep with the shepherd, the man who goes out after losing just one sheep and leaves everybody else behind. Because Those sheep are safe. They are the member of the flock. The shepherd is willing to go after the one that has strayed. Repentance. What do you know about sheep? They do everything the other sheep do. You know, if, I mean, there's the story of one sheep jumping off the cliff and all the other sheep jump off the cliff. You know, they're not real smart animals. So we got this one that's really kind of, you know, kind of, not intelligent at all, doesn't even stay with the group. He goes off. And Jesus is still concerned about the weird one, the one that's the problem, the one that's lost. The one, he knows these people in the kingdom are safe. 
But I still got to go after that one. I've got to risk it all to go after that one. It's as precious as all the others. And then there's the parable of the lost coin. So now we have the male female pairing back, and she's lost her coin. Now, it doesn't seem like a lot, but I've lost the remote control at my house, and it causes me great grief and anger when I can't find the remote control. So I stop everything to look for the remote control for my TV. But this woman is, lo- is looking for a coin. She only has ten. She knows the other nine are safe, but she's got to find the one. She's got to find the one. And when she finds it, she is so elated that she invites everybody in to celebrate with her. Well, I don't invite people in to celebrate my finding of the remote control, okay? But if I'm talking to my husband, I might say, you know, it fell down between the couches, and I had to move the couch, you know, but I'm so glad I found the rem- My husband really doesn't care. Um, <laughs> but these people cared. You know, they came in and celebrated with her. The kingdom is celebrating the finding of the one. The finding of the one. Perhaps she could have lived with none, but it was important to find the one. A flock of sheep of 99 isn't going to be extremely better off with one more sheep. But it was important to the shepherd. And he can only celebrate when the lost sheep is found. In chapter 16, the parable of the dishonest manager, where his boss asked him to give an account of his, his management, you know, how have you, how have you dealt with my belongings? And he, he's the one that says, okay, I'm in trouble. I think Father Griffith talked about this a couple of weeks ago. I'm in trouble. If, I, if, I, if he knows I've been fudging, if he knows I'm a bad manager, I'm going to get fired. If I get fired, I'm not going to have anything. And so, because he's a lousy manager, see, so he doesn't have any money saved up for himself. He's lousy at this. So, um, so he, he knows what's going to happen. He's going to lose his job. He's going to lose his livelihood. So what he begins to do is go out to those people who are in debt to his boss and say, what do you owe? Cut this down to this. What do you owe? Cut this down to this. Because he wants them, he's probably still going to lose his job, okay? He still think I'm going to lose my job. But if I give them a break, they're going to give me a break. Now, Jesus just said, don't expect repayment. But this guy's expecting something back. And Jesus tells us here, you know, he gets kind of a pat on the back from his boss saying, you know, it's pretty wise, you know. You, you, you knew what it was going to take to live, even though I was probably going to fire you. You know, so... In a way, you were helping these people out, but now you're helping yourself. Your motive probably isn't the greatest in the world, but it makes sense. But Jesus tells us about this dishonest manager. He said, those who are dishonest in little are going to be dishonest in much. Those who are not faithful to the wealth they have they're going to be dis- if they're if they've been faithful to dishonest wealth, something that they've stolen, something that's not theirs. They're not going to be faithful when they're offered honest wealth. If you're not faithful with the money and the possessions you have here, why would God expect you to be faithful and honest in the gifts that He's going to give to you in the kingdom? If it's all about you here. Is it going to be all about you there? A slave can't serve two masters. They hate one and love the other. You can't serve God and wealth. You have to give that up. It's a worldly thing. We think it's going to save us. We think it's going to keep our lives going. Wealth is what's going to save us. And God is saying... I'm what's going to save you. If you depend on that, you won't depend on me. 
You have to be able to let go of that completely so you can depend on me completely. Now, this is where Father Griffith last week, this is where the parable of the rich man and Lazarus comes in. So if you weren't here or you didn't see that from last week, um, I believe it's still, it's still on, online on our Facebook page or our uh, YouTube page, correct? Okay, so there's, it's on our website too. So I highly encourage you, if you miss those three uh, important parables that Father Griffith was talking on last week, that you go back and watch those because they're going to fall right in line with all of this. Now, in chapter 7, so once we move out of the rich man and Lazarus, we get into chapter 17 and the ten lepers. And you know that story. I mean, that's a little kid story, right? You need to be, you need to thank God. You know, this is, you know, God's going to do something wonderful for you, and you need to go back and you thank God. But the thing about this is, this, the scripture actually said, none return to praise God except the foreigner. And Jesus doesn't say, I'm so glad that you came back to thank me. He doesn't say that. He does ask what happened to the other nine. They were the ones that should have known to come back and thank him. They were the ones that should have known to come back and praise God. But this foreigner is the one that figures it out. He's not of this worldly kingdom group who's thinking only about themselves. He's from an otherworldly group. And he realizes the gift that Jesus has just given him. He has that faith in Jesus to do that. And so when the foreigner returns, Jesus asks where the other nine are. But then he tells them, go on. Your faith has healed you. Your faith has healed you. And, that, and the healed leper praises God. Now, the Pharisees in the chapter are going to ask, they've, they've gotten this kind of kingdom thing. You know, there's, he's talking about a kingdom. He's talking about a different kingdom. He's not talking about the, what's going on. What's this kingdom he's talking about? And they want to know when the kingdom of God is coming so they can look for it. And the kingdom, Jesus says, the kingdom of God is not coming with things that can be observed. For, in fact, the kingdom of God is among you. Things that can be observed are you'll be richer. You'll be better off. You'll be more important. You'll have more food. You'll have a better place at the table. We can see all of that. Isn't that great? When the kingdom comes, we're going to have all of these great things that we can see and brag about. It's not coming that way. In fact, the kingdom is of God is among you. It's here. It's in your faith. Jesus is the king. And the kingdom is in us. We are the builders of the kingdom. We have to possess the materials we need to build the kingdom. The kingdom is in us. I truly believe that everyone God ever created has a role to play in the kingdom. Is it observable? Is, do I know when I'm born what my role is going to be in the kingdom? Do we even know when I become a member of the kingdom? Many of you were baptized as infants into the kingdom. Did you know what your role was going to be then? Well, if you didn't, let me tell you what it was. Priest, prophet, king. But not the priests that we think about in the old ages where they wore the bells on their robes and all of that, Fred, to tell everybody they were coming so they could, you know, kind of worship those, those prophets, those priests, not that. Not, not the prophets that foretold doom. and th not, not that. We're not that. We are not kings that sit on thrones. No, not that. Those are things you can see, hear, touch. We're priest, prophet, and king here. Here. Jesus has touched our heart. He's healed us. He's healed us. And so we're priests that proclaim God. 
We're priests that can help people reach out and help. We're the prophets that proclaim the kingdom to each person that we meet. And we're the kings and the queens because we are the brothers and sisters of a king. And we're the daughters and sons of God. The kingdom is here. And Jesus, it's present in Jesus. It's also present in the disciples. It's now present in the woman who was healed, who has been over. It's now present in the, the man who had dropsy. It's present in the leper who was foreign and the only one to return. And Jesus to tell him, your faith healed you. That's what it means to be a member of the kingdom. You have the faith. You don't have the things. And now Jesus is going to begin to speak about his coming suffering and his rejection when he gets to Jerusalem. But they're not going to understand it. So why are we being told? We're being told because we know that Jesus knows. And we know that Jesus can make a choice. He's human. He doesn't have to go to Jerusalem. He doesn't have to suffer. He doesn't have to be rejected by his own people. He's speaking to let us know he knows. And therefore, he chooses to travel on. To travel on to the cross. To travel on and be rejected in the end by his people as he was in the beginning of Luke's gospel when he tells us no prophet is welcomed by their own. No prophet is welcomed by their own. Bookending these statements. In chapter 18, this is the way that we get through things like this. Pray always, don't lose heart. And there's the parable of the widow and the judge. I love this story because it reminds me of being married. <laughs> your wife or your husband, and I'm, I'm a bit of a feminist, so I'm, so I'm going to say, but I'm going to do this. Your wife wants something, because this is how it always comes out, right? Your wife wants something, won't leave you alone. And you finally give up, okay? So you say, I give up. You can have it. You know, it's just not worth it, Okay. The husbands can do that too, but uh, I think usually it's with bigger items, cars, motorcycles, you know, th <laughs> you know things like that. So, um, so we can both do this. We can just beat up somebody and beat up somebody and beat them up until they just have to give in. And this poor widow, she knows the law. She knows that the Jewish community, the leaders, the judges, the Pharisees, she knows that they're supposed to take care of the orphans and the widows. So it's important that she's a widow, and it's important that she's asking for something, and it's important that she continues to ask for, for this because you have, the judge needs to follow the law. And finally he does. He's like, leave me alone. I'm going to give her what she wants so she'll leave me alone. And what's the message in that? God will quickly grant justice to his chosen one who cry out to him day and night. Now, it changes a little because this, I'm using the word quickly here. You know, we don't know how long she was like screaming at his window or whatever. But God will quickly grant justice to the ones who cry out to him day and night. Justice, justice. What is rightfully theirs? Verses 9 through 14 talk about the self-righteousness of the Pharisee and, once again, tax collectors. All who exalt themselves will be humbled, and the humble will be exalted. Verses 15 through 17, a story we're very familiar with, Let the little children come to me. These are the ones who belong to the kingdom of God. 
We all love that story. Children love that story. We have all kinds of pictures with Jesus and children that we know is with that story. And what I was reading, and I did use the same source that um, Father Griffith had used, the Gospel of Luke by Luke Timothy Johnson. Um, it's, it's a little deep, but, you know, if you ever find a copy or something lying around someplace, it's good. It's really good. Um, it's going to break apart probably a little more than the average person would like to know, but there's always an interpretation. And that's what's really interesting. You can break it down phrase by phrase, but the interpretation in this, the interpretations that he presents, it's really good. He's a great scholar. Um, but it says, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. And Johnson uses the term infant, not child where we see in the picture you know we see the little children that are about this tall you know little you know toddlers and you know eight nine ten year olds but, but Johnson says a better translation of that is infant somebody totally dependent that's how you have to enter the kingdom of God Why, how do we know that because we had to give up everything we had to give up everything. We have to be totally dependent when we enter the kingdom on God. There's nothing we can take with us. You know, there's no diaper bag <laughs> that we're taking with us. There is no backpack that we're putting on. We, we can't take any. We're totally helpless. When we enter the kingdom of God, that's the only way that God can totally help us. The rich ruler comes in at verses 18 and 30 of chapter 18. And we know this story. We've heard it. There's a Matthean story that's kind of a parallel to this. Teacher, and Jesus, why are you calling me Teacher. Because basically, to you guys, I'm a pain in the side. <laughs> you know, so now all of a sudden, I'm a teacher. You know, so, um, so, but he, the rich ruler says, what do I do to inherit eternal life? Keep the commandments. Jesus goes through the list. And he said, I've done all that. I've done all that. I'm a keeper of the law. And then Jesus says, sell all you own and distribute the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then, once you're totally dependent, come follow me. Give it all up and depend on me. And the rich man became sad because he was very rich. Couldn't do it. Could keep those laws, but couldn't lose his security blanket of his earthly wealth. And so the question comes up now, how hard is it to enter the kingdom of God? And Jesus tells us that story about the camel going through the eye of a needle. And Johnson says, don't use that as symbolism or as a, as a um, metaphor, metaphor. Don't use that as a metaphor for a camel getting through a small door or gate in the walls of a protected city. Don't, don't use it that way. Jesus was probably being literal. It is, you, it is like a camel trying to get through the eye of a needle. It's literal. If you're going to depend upon your wealth and what you have here and what you've accumulated here and the greatness of you to enter the kingdom of God then becomes like trying to get a camel through the eye of a needle. And so the question now becomes, well, then who can be saved? Because a camel through the eye of a needle is impossible. It's not possible. How is it possible for mortal people to be saved? And Jesus says, what? What's impossible for humans is possible for God. You have to depend on God. 
You are little camels trying to get through the eye of a needle. You cannot do it yourselves. You have to depend on God. Now, Peter's been listening, and he says, well, we left everything. And Jesus, kind of in his kindness to be a little reassuring to uh, Peter, because we might say that to God, well, I, I gave up everything. What's in it for me? <laughs> I gave up everything, just like you said. And Jesus says those who have given up much for the kingdom will get back much more in this age and the age to come. What did Peter get back in this age? Well, he became the first pope. He got back in this age the ability to preach the resurrected Jesus to thousands of people, to cure them, to build the kingdom from Jesus and 12 disciples into the early church and into what we have today. He also got crucified on a cross, just like Jesus. But that was his entrance into the kingdom, where the real reward awaits. Now we're going to get, Luke's chapters are kind of long sometimes, so just know that. He, he writes long chapters. Um, but verses 31 through 34 tells us that the twelve are continuing to travel to Jerusalem. And the my pages seem a little out, or I just didn't do something. Um, okay, so he tells them we're traveling to Jerusalem. This is the place where all the prophets have written about the Son of Man. This is the place where it's going to come true. And he kind of spells that out in pretty clear terms. But the disciples don't understand. We do, we have the end of the story. But they don't have a clue what he's talking about. What did the prophets write? You know, how does that apply to you know, what we're doing? So we're left in their confusion, as we would have been at the time if Jesus had been talking about that, and we would have been on the outside of their crowd. We wouldn't have understood it. So in verses 35 through 43, there's the healing of the blind man. Receive your sight. Your faith has saved you. Your faith has saved you. Who else's faith saved them? The leper. Who else's faith saved her? The crippled woman. Faith, faith, faith. It's not Jesus doing magic tricks. It's faith. So, receive your sight. Your faith has saved you. So who can become saved? Those who have faith. What happened to the blind man here? He immediately followed Jesus and together with the crowd praised God. He immediately follows Jesus. And now we're into the last chapter that I'm going to present. I've got just enough time to present the first part. I'm not going to get to the Second part of the parable of the ten, uh, of the ten pounds, uh, which is unfortunately one of the most difficult parables, I guess, that Jesus tells. Um, you're going to have to wait for another time. But I'm going to talk about Zacchaeus a little, okay? Because another, ki another kid story uh, that I grew up with, you know, was Zacchaeus up the sycamore tree. Who is Zacchaeus? Well, Zacchaeus was the chief tax collector. Now, if you think the the little tax collectors in their little cubicles were hated. The chief tax collector is hated more. And if you thought the little cubicle tax collectors were making money off the poor, the chief tax collectors making money off of them. So he's pretty well off. But he, for some reason, hears about Jesus, and this seems to light a fire in him. He wants to know who this Jesus is, and he's short. You know, the older I get, the shorter I get, so the more I can identify with this story. <laughs> I used to be able to reach the top of the cabinets, and I used to be able to see over things, but I can't now. And so, you know, there's, there's this problem. He's part of this crowd, this giant crowd. You know, I, I kind of see it as getting bigger and bigger along the way as the, road, as the word spreads that Jesus is traveling. He's about six hours outside of Jerusalem. He's in Jericho now. So, so the crowd is still there. They've still been with him. And Zacchaeus is like, well, I want to know what's going on. 
How many of you rubberneck crowds, you know, on the other side of the road? What's going on? Recently, I've seen the teachers striking, you know. And so the first time I saw it, it was like, what's going on? You know, what's going on in the crowd? And so it's not Zacchaeus that hollers down to Jesus when Jesus passes by. It's Jesus who looks up and actually calls Zacchaeus by name. He says, Zacchaeus, come down from that tree. I want, to, I want to go to your house today. I want to eat with you today. I want to talk with you today. I want to be happy and celebrate with you today. By name, Jesus invites this sinner. And Zacchaeus is thrilled the person he wanted to see actually wants to see him. This great guy with these thousands of people are following. He wants to see Zacchaeus by name. He didn't ask, who wants to invite me for dinner? I'm hungry. You know, oh, yeah, let's go to my house. You know, it's just right down the road. No, Jesus has already made this decision about Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus is in contrast to the rich ruler in chapter 18. The ruler had kept all, the poor, the poor ruler who went away sad, remember, the ruler has kept all the commandments, but he won't be saved because he does not have the faith necessary to give up all he has for the poor. He leaves sad, but Zacchaeus is happy. Zacchaeus has gained his wealth through dishonest means, he admits that, but he is willing to give half of everything he has to the poor and pay back four times what he's stolen from anybody. This is required by Jewish law. Jewish law tells you how to do these things. So the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees who aren't happy with this, who don't like the tax collector, he's unclean, don't want to have anything to do with them, this guy's now kind of going to say, I'm going to follow the law. I'm going to give back to the poor, and I'm going to pay back more than I took. And Jesus says he is the one who truly understands what it means to be a son of Abraham. The crippled woman was the daughter of Abraham. And now Zacchaeus truly understands what it means to be the son of Abraham. Zacchaeus was lost and Jesus sought him out and brought salvation to his house. Jesus has saved the lost because of their faith. Now, I'm going to end on this because this is about a journey. There's a song, maybe Deb remembers it, I don't know. If some of you grew up Protestant, you may remember it. It's a kind of 70s type of song. I have decided to follow Jesus. Do you know that song? The words go like this. I'm not singing because I'm on live stream, okay? <laughs> I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me, no turning back, no turning back. Though none go with me, I still will follow. Though none go with me, I still will follow. No turning back, no turning back. That's what it means to be on a journey with Jesus to Jerusalem. The cross before us, the world behind us. No turning back. Thank you so much.